and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances, that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. The word of the Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. This first and greatest commandment and Jesus' expansion of it reveal how Jesus Messiah fulfills the deepest intentions, 
power and mystery of the two great pillars of Israel's faith, Torah and temple, commandment and blood. We need to start with the pinnacle of the Torah, this morning's Deuteronomy reading. If there was a reading to kind of to sum up, to culminate the whole witness of Torah, the first five books of the Bible, this is it. This, is, by the way, is what a lot of Jewish boys at age 12 learned to say in he Hebrew, Shema Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. This is the heart, the very essence of the theological and ethical program of Deuteronomy as a book to which the Pharisees in Jesus' day considered themselves the rightful heirs. Kind of, you have to imagine that it, you know, just before this passage, which we, uh, you haven't seen because you know, and that we, we're skipping around, but just before this passage, Jesus has been in his famous debate with the Sadducees about the resurrection. The Sadducees ran the temple. They were kind of Leviticus people. You know, they, they kind of did all the, the sacrifices and all that stuff. The Pharisees were Deuteronomy people. And now we all have our favorite books in the Bible. And for the Pharisees, Deuteronomy was it. Right? The Pharisees considered themselves the rightful heirs. And Torah, or Deuteronomy, and the witness of Torah has structured by the book of Deuteronomy. They, if not privileged over the other books of the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament, at the very least put it on an equal footing with the sacrificial system and worship life of the temple itself. Now, we have to note that this was not anti-Judaism. These were Jews. <laughs> the Pharisees were Jews. In fact, they were like ultra-Jews, right? So the critique of the temple sacrificial system of the offering of the blood of goats and bulls, as we have in the lesson from the Hebrews, to criticize that was not anti-Jewish or anti-Judaism. It was really channeling things like Psalm 50. It's right here in the text, Psalm 50, starting at verse five. Gather before me my loyal followers, those who made a covenant with me, covenant, Torah, Sinai, okay, who made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice, Torah, temple, commandment, Covenant, blood, all, it's all come, it all comes together. It goes on. Hear, O my people. That should sound familiar to you. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. This is God speaking. O Israel, I will bear witness against you, for I am God, your God. This should sound really familiar if you have today's lesson ringing in your ears. I am God, your God. I do not accuse you because of your sacrifices, your offerings are always before me. I will take no bull calf from your stalls, nor he goats out of your pens. The blood of goats and bulls, right? That's the whole. So when, whenever you hear that God is not impressed with the blood of goats or bulls, this is a, that's a whole shtick coming right out of the language of the Psalms. For all the beasts of the forest are mine. Basically, God reminds them, I made it all. Right? Remember, I'm the Lord your God. I, I made it all. I don't need it, you know, if I wanted, if I wanted barbecue, I could make it, okay? That's like, it's like, you know, the herds in their thousands are mine. All those longhorns and West Texas, yeah, they're all mine. I got them all. I don't need them from you. I know every bird in the sky and the creatures of the fields are in my sight. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. I'm, I'm quoting right from the psalm here. For the whole world is mine and all that is in it. Do you think? I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. In Greek, that would come out Eucharist, by the way. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall honor me. That's what's on the table. That's the relationship that God has on offer to human beings. This was the relationship between human beings and God, which the people of Israel were called to open up and teach, open up to and teach the world about. So this is actually a critique of the 
spirituality of Israel from within the tradition itself. And so that's one thing that we as Christians, I think, in a sense, we bring to the world. In a sense, in a sense we can say, when people say, you Christians, you're hypocrites, we should be able to say, yes, but at least we have the resources to diagnose our own hypocrisy. <laughs> you got nothing, <laughs> right? All you have is boosterism. We actually have a tradition of critiquing ourselves. It's in the text. All right, I'm moving on. Jesus points to this very passage as the key to understanding his mission and identity. So on the one hand, you might think, oh, wow, Jesus is a Pharisee, right? And that's how a scribe who asked the question, this is how a scribe would answer. Remember, you know, remember the scribe says, oh, yes, you're right, Jesus, much more important than all the blood of goats and bulls, all the sacrifice of the temple. But Jesus is pointing this very passion is the key to understanding his mission identity because he will fulfill it in a paradoxical and powerful way. Now, there are three things to notice about this passage in Deuteronomy in order to be able to, you know, kind of get into what Jesus is about when he says he's about this passage. First of all, first of all, you have heard me because I have recently preached. This is the advantage of coming to all the lectures and the courts. I have recently preached about St. Paul's use and emphasis of the word pistis. Right? Pistis is faith, loyalty, trust. Right? That whole semantic range of meanings. St. Paul emphasizes pistis to his Greco-Roman convert audience, those Greco-Roman churches, right? He emphasizes pistis, or faith, translated as faith in the Bible, in the English Bible, has the response God is seeking from human beings. Right? That's what he tells the Greeks, that's what God wants from us. But for Israel, and especially for Deuteronomy, it is not pistis, or faith, that God asks for, it is is love it is love so when anyone tries to tell you that the old testament is god is a judgy god is an angry god punishing god all you have to do with jesus is point to the first and greatest commandment love the lord your god god's desire for the human response is one of love that is privileged over all other responses we may have to god and they'll have other responses we ought to have, right? Fear, obedience, holiness, blah, blah, blah. But love is privileged. Love is the first thing God wants from us. Love. Now, we have to be clear. This is not love have we, as we have received it from the Greeks <laughs> with eros and all the other sorts of loves that the Greeks taught us about. Phylos, brotherly love, right? You know, the, the Greeks, they, they, you know, they, I've preached on this too. The Greeks have three words for love, right? Agape, the, the divine, unconditional love that most closely resembles the Hebrew word for love that we have in this text in Deuteronomy, the closest Greek word that Paul gave, agape. And there's phylos, right? Brotherly love and eros, erotic what we may call romantic or partner love. Now, unlike that sort of love that we know, we exchange cards on Valentine's Day, you know, heart you, you know, that's, that's not what the Bible's talking about. It's love for the Semites, for the people of Israel. Love is not an emotional affect. You know, it's, it's not something that's like a warm fuzzy or something. That's not what love is to them. Love is a commitment of oneself to an other. That's what love is, a commitment of oneself to an other. So to love, I am like, I am the Lord, the Lord your God is one. I'm basically, I'm it. That's what that, if you want to translate what monotheism is, I'm it, I'm the only show in town. Okay, hear me. I'm the only, I'm the only game in town. And I want you to love me 
What he's asking for is, I want you to commit yourself to me. Right? So in Israel's scriptures, love takes in both the aspect of positive regard. I mean, in the sense that, yes, you think positively of the person or that, you know, that you love. But it also takes in that aspect of loyalty, too. That is to say that in the scriptures of Israel, love does a lot of the work that Paul's trying to do with pistis. Right? Loyalty, commitment to a person or a cause, to love. It says, you know, for example, that Jonathan, Saul's son, loved David. What, that he had positive regard for David, but what it meant is that he chose David as the one he would be loyal to as the future king of Israel over and against the claims of his father Saul. That's what that means in the story and in the language of Israel. Okay? So, for Semitic faith, you know, and I've quoted recently, you know, we say, you know, loving, you know, that old movie, loving someone means never having to say you're sorry. For the Semites, Loving someone means that you are totally loyal to them. It says, I'm, it's been, I'm with you, thick or thin. I am in covenant with you. It is a commitment of the self. This is what's underneath when Jesus says in John's gospel, see, John captures a lot of this Semitic emphasis on love. For example, in the Last Supper, when Jesus says, no greater love hath a man than this, that he would what? die for his friends that is hebrew love you're willing to die for someone because you are loyal to them because you will not abandon them when the chips are down that is what love is about for the old testament for the spirituality of israel which is commended to us secondly we have to pay attention to this passage in Deuteronomy. This love is structured by the relationship in which it exists. It's structured by the relationship. Much like pistis is structured by the relationship. That is, pistis on the part of you know, loyalty or trust is different from on the part of a commanding officer as opposed to someone under his command. There are different obligations that that same pistis places on the two parties because of the nature of the relationship that they're in. A key difference, though, between pistis and love, as we encountered in Deuteronomy, is that pistis's semantic range outside the New Testament, that is, how did Greeks use it before Paul got a hold of it, right, is defined by the relationships that existed within the polis, that is within a political community, a town, a city, right? That in a sense you were loyal. It's kind of like, you know, the, you know, the beach boys, be true to your school. It's like you're true to, you are true to your city. You know, you are loyal to your city, loyal to the people of your polis. That was pistis, you know, kind of working for the good of a city, of your people, of your town or a military unit. That was the other place where pistis language lived. So it was a political word, and Paul uses that because that's what Greco-Roman converts knew. That's how they talked about what Paul was trying to get at from them in relationship to Jesus Messiah. That's why Paul relies on military metaphor so often. It's not because he was a wannabe Roman centurion. It was because that was the world they lived in. That was how the term used to be used until, again, Paul got a hold of it and applied it to Jesus Messiah and his followers. But note how Deuteronomy roots the word love. What is the set of relationships that defines the normative semantic range of love in Deuteronomy? It's the family. Take, these, take this commandment I'm giving, it, giving to you and... Tell it to your children and to your children's children. That is, love in the scriptures which Jesus knew, the scriptures which everybody who was listening to Jesus and today's gospel would have known, was a family-based word. A family-based word. That is, what Jesus is suggesting 
as he, and in a sense, pointing towards in Deuteronomy, is that God is forming a human family more, you know, more than an ethnicity or a tribe. God is forming a family by his prior liberating, graceful action in Exodus. That is what God was up to. So remember, Deuteronomy takes place at the end of Exodus. It's like they, they've gotten through the wilderness and they're just about to make it to the promised land. And this is how you're supposed to live forever and ever in the promised land. So in a sense, what God has done by bringing them out of death and slavery, Egypt, is he's formed a new family. That's why, by the way, so many of these stories are about a family, Abraham's family. Right? It's because love, that commitment to the other, is about, is, that's the model that the scriptures raise up. That's the normative model. In contrast to what you experience in the military or in politics, thank goodness, right? That family is the normative mode in which this love that God is wanting from human beings is expressed. Loyalty to family. To love God is to be loyal to God as a child is to a parent. That's the model that the scriptures of Israel raise up for us to live into. This is the scriptural warrant for Jesus' teaching us to address God as Father when he teaches them how to pray. How should you pray to God? Should you address him as... You have to remember, folks, that there were options on the table. I mean, there were others, like, our king, hallowed be thy name. Our maker, hallowed be thy name. I mean, I could go through a long list, actually, and, you know, a long list. So Jesus chooses Abba, our dad, our intimate father, right? That's who Jesus says. That's who you're praying to. If, you, if you're praying with me in mind, Jesus is saying, you're praying to a God who loves you tenderly and is loyal to you tenderly like a father. He says in another place, Hey, people, you guys are total sinners, but you actually figure out how to give good presents to your children. How much more will God, who loves you, as a father loves his children, give you good things, forever things? That's what Jesus is pointing towards. That's what he's trying to remind them of. Has his context, as the Israelites in Jesus' day are completely fixed on getting their kingdom back, on getting their political life back, on getting military superiority over their neighbors back. Jesus is saying that's not what God is interested in. God is interested in you getting your family back. And not only that, in his expansion of the first and greatest commandment into neighbor love, he is saying, by the way, that family is going to include everybody. You know, connect neighbor love to parable of the Good Samaritan, right? S sermon's already long, so I just have to reference these things. Go do your homework, people. <laughs> no, I can't help you. But that's, what, that's the subversive and radical expansion of the first and greatest commandment that Jesus is trying to get at, is that the family is going to start to include neighbors in an ever-increasing kind of concentric radius. And by the way, that's the drama of Acts of the Apostles. Again, you just have to read the book for yourself, but that's the drama of Acts of the Apostles has one by one all these walls between Israel and her neighbors fall as the church first right, reaches out to non-Judean Jews in Pentecost and then reaches out to Samaritans and then begins to evangelize Romans who worship at the synagogue and then just start picking up pagans wherever they can find them. That's, that's the drama of Acts. That's the beautiful drama. As the church lives out these two commandments that Jesus gave as a key to understanding what it means to be his family. His family means to be, to make everyone a part of his family. That's the kind of, that's the paradoxical thing is basically if you want to be a part of my family, you have to make everyone in my family. If you're not willing to have everybody in my family, then you're not part of my family. That's the, that's the paradoxical challenge that Jesus lays down, right? Where it, 
you notice how it puts the onus on us, doesn't it? God is there with open arms. You just have to be an open arms person too. <laughs> That's a challenge, isn't it? Jesus teaches us to address God as Father, not because God is male somehow, that's, that's Greek pagan stuff, but because he's, well, the position of mom was already taken by Mary, so it teaches us that we're all brothers and sisters. And it structures the love we have for one another and the love we have for God within those relationships by associating it with loving provision and loving obedience. I'm not talking about how dads and children should you know, dare to discipline. I'm not talking about any sort of modern stuff. I'm just saying that in the world of Jesus, let's just leave it at that. In the world of Jesus, the father was associated with provision. That was his end of the bargain, loving provision, giving good gifts to his children, giving the inheritance of the farm, right? This is the family farm, it's yours now. That's what the father's job was. And the children's job was loving obedience, working towards the father's good, right? working for the good of the family. That was the, response, the loving response of the children. And you didn't have to like it. Remember the parable of the prodigal son. The oldest son doesn't have to like it. Right? He just has to be willing to receive the younger son back. That's the requirement. Right? You don't have to, in a sense, like doing what God is asking you to do. Semites are very practical. You just have to do it. <laughs> very practical and very hard. I think this is why when St. Paul gets most excited in his argument or his sermon, if you will, kind of wines are blurred, he reverts to his scriptural roots and uses the word love. And I'll end on that in a second. But when Paul gets most excited, when his blood is up, he uses the word love because he can't help it. He's a Jew and he knows his Bible. Right? He forgets about that pista stuff and he goes back to love. Finally, there is a structure to this passage in Deuteronomy that is common in Hebrew thought, in poetry, in its prophecy, and in, by the way, in the letters of Paul. It's called a chiasm. C-H-I-A-S-M. A chiasm. It's an X. But it's basically a thematic development where it kind of goes in this direction and then loops back on itself with the, you have a middle word. So basically, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and mind together as a unit, and all your might or strength, kind of the physical aspect of the human person. So the heart, again, is not the romantic place. It's not, no, it's not that. The heart is the seat of decision and commitment. Right? In a sense, they felt that the heart was where you decided the most important things. Right? The mind or soul, your personality, basically your intellection and your emotional life, that too must be committed to God. So you must commit to God with decision, kind of like I commit to you existentially. You are my God. You are, the, you are my only game in town. And to commit to God with, all your, with your thinking processes, to, to seek to think as God would have us to think, as Paul would say, let your minds be transformed, right? And to, in a sense, your emotional life is structured by that family love that God wants from us and for us to share with each other, with our neighbor family as well. And our might or strength, basically those intrinsic or extrinsic properties that we possess in our body and in our resources, we're called to commit those to God too, our might, right? In a sense, might does, I mean, Solomon had might, not because he could bench press his weight, it's because he had the resources to affect his will, right? That's what strength means. It's not, again, it's not like in the gym, it's do you have the resources to accomplish your ends? And so we are called to mobilize our resources, our extrinsic resources to accomplish God's end. That's what it means to love God, to be loyal to him, to put our stuff towards the cause. So heart, mind, soul, strength. And then where are we to bind these commandments? First, the hand symbolic of might or strength, the right hand of the Lord shall accomplish thus and so. The Lord's hand was upon him. It doesn't mean the Lord actually put his hand. It means that God's strength 
his activity was made manifest, right? So to bind it on your hand involves your extrinsic, your strength, your ability to accomplish things in the world. To bind it to your head, that's pretty basic, you know, your intellection and your kind of emotional capacities, those are to be claimed by the commandment to love God, and as Jesus expands it, to love neighbor family. And then you get this doorpost thing. What is it about with the doorpost? Bind it on your doorpost. It's not just so your neighbors can see it, I guess. You know, Brian's like, you know, um, you know, in this house we believe, I guess, <laughs> this is Shema Israel, okay? You know, it's like we put yard signs out. That's not what it's about. The doorpost. Well, whenever you encounter something like this, let me give you a hint. Go to the Bible and figure out where doorposts are used. Now, you might be able to recall if there was a time in the Exodus story before Deuteronomy is received where doorposts come in. The doorposts were to be smeared with blood. What blood? The blood of a Passover lamb. That blood. The blood of the Passover lamb is to be smeared on the doorpost and it's in the position, in the chiasm, right? So, so there's this chiasm, this symbolic linkage, has heart, has decision for, has total commitment of oneself to. And that is Jesus. Jesus shows us how he is committed with his whole heart to the love of his father and the love of his neighbors, you and me by giving his own blood, as the lesson to the Hebrew, epistle of the Hebrews says, his own blood is smeared on the doorposts of our very hearts. Our own hearts become the temple. By the way, Paul says this in Corinthians, that don't you know that you are a temple for the Holy Spirit? That the human heart then becomes the microcosmic temple, the place where God resides in the human person. And Jesus, by smearing his own blood of mercy and forgiveness, allows the commandment to love to be transformed from something extrinsic to you to something intrinsically transformative in you. That is, love is not something that is a chore from outside. But if you let Jesus' love walk into the temple of your heart through the doorpost smeared with the Passover lamb's blood, love becomes something that transforms you from the inside out. Love is something that becomes the center of who you are, of your identity, and your mission, that you are fundamentally one who loves God and loves your neighbors in his name. And see, that creates a family where there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female, neither master nor slave, nor all the other divisions which our society can come up with, but Paul points to. None of those things matter anymore when we commit ourselves to our own identity and mission as lovers of God and lovers of our neighbors, as those committed to God and committed to others, committed to them with everything that we have, that our life, in a sense, begins to be defined by how we can be a blessing to them, as Israel was called to be a blessing to the nations. That's Jesus' mission and his identity. And this is why Paul will link these things together when he'll say things like, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When he'll say in Romans, God proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For Paul, Jesus' death on the cross, the blood that he sheds 
in that place and at that time is something that is the culmination of all of God's love and is the source of all of our love for one another. That's when he gets excited. It's all about love. This is why he can say that nothing in all creation will have the power to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Love becomes the center of everything. Love becomes our mission. It becomes who we are in Jesus. So here, O oh St. Matthews, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And bind it on your hand and on your forehead and put it on the doorposts of your hearts and then tell it to the children. Amen. Please rise. Loving one another, let us with one mind, Christ, Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in essence and undivided. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary. And was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With our whole heart and mind, let us pray to the Lord. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for our armed forces and first responders and for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. We pray for your divine guidance to show each of us how you are calling us to be instruments of racial reconciliation and the healing of your human family. And we pray for the courage to respond to your call. We pray also for Christian missionaries around the world who are helping those in need and spreading the gospel. Bless them, protect them, and by the power of your divine grace, help them in their kingdom work. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Lord Jesus Christ, who didst 
stretch out thine arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of thy saving embrace. So clothe us in thy spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know thee to the knowledge and love of thee, for the honor of thy name. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please rise. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. for worship this Sunday morning at St. Matthew's Cathedral, and if you're worshiping us for the, for the first time or you haven't had an opportunity to fill out one of the guest cards you found in front of you, I encourage you to do so and put it in the offering plate, then it journeys to the appropriate person, and, uh, and it's an opportunity for us to include you in the life of this family of Jesus in this particular place. And as we uh, lean into the coming week, uh, we'll have on Tuesday evening, um, uh, this uh, at 7 p.m., uh, a Requiem for All Souls, as we remember all those in our family that we have lost, and especially since All Souls 2019, and in that season in which we could not gather in person to come alongside members of our family who lost loved ones, this is our opportunity to do so, and so it will be a special uh season in which we offer up to God um, all those whom we've lost, all those whom we've lost in our larger family here in the states and the world uh, to the COVID pandemic, and uh, but also remember God's mercy and his goodness and his presence to us. So um, as a preview, uh, you know, I'll be, I've been thinking about, because I know this is coming, I've been thinking about this homily for a little while, so um, it'll be, it, the homily will focus on our hope uh, in, in life eternal. And kind of if you've ever asked yourself the question, what happens after we die before the resurrection? Come on Tuesday night. Come on Tuesday night. I'll share with you what Paul and what the tradition of the church has taught happens. And then as we lean forward into the celebration after that, it just the calendar is weird this year. And so October 31st falling on a Sunday. And so that has pushed All Saints Sunday deep into November. November 7th will be All Saints Sunday. And uh, so we'll be celebrating the feast then. And uh, the bishop will be with us to celebrate the Sacrament of Confirmation. And uh, so we'll be welcoming new members into our parish family uh, liturgically and sacramentally. So that's something that will be a joyful occasion. I hope you can share with us in that. And then November 14th is Commitment Sunday, in which we are called to offer up our tithes and offerings and our estimates and giving for the coming year of ministry, in which we're called to love God with all our might, and including the might expressed in your pocketbook. Uh, so if you didn't catch that in the sermon, I'll make it explicit now. And uh, so we'll offer that up on November 14th, and I hope you can be present to us as we consecrate those offerings. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice unto God.
lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and our archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever has seen this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs> and love, which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament to the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Matthew, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the peace. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> and the peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessed God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.